Long weekends like the Easter long weekend means that you're often having friends over for dinner, which means you need to plan a menu. So I thought I'd put together a compilation of like my favorite menu ideas for friends for dinner. I have everything from baked ham to cheesy gochujang potatoes, pulled pork spring rolls, and then dessert, I've got dim sum custard tarts and that Australian classic, the pavlova. So enjoy my friends and I hope your friends enjoy. Sticky, jammy, glazed ham, perfect for like an afternoon sunset on the jetty. It makes the ultimate ham sandwich. This is my Chinese five spice and blackberry glazed ham. So a glazed ham kind of looks like one of those very impressive, kind of hard to make dishes, but I'm gonna walk you through it step by step, how you take the skin off, how we prepare the ham. And then of course, my glaze has a few little surprise Asian ingredients because you know I'm me. <laughs> all right, let's do that glaze first of all. And I always start off with a fruit jam. So today I'm using a blackberry jam, but you know, I've used cherry jam, plum jam, uh, you know, apricot jam, any of those things is really great. And you need some brown sugar as well. And here's where we go a little bit rogue with some Chinese cooking wine. You could of course just use a little bit of apple juice or pineapple juice if you like. I do like the beautiful kind of floral flavor that Chinese cooking wine has. And then some Chinese five spice as well. And now we'll just give that a mix and just bring that up to a gentle simmer. Just be careful because it is quite sweet so you don't want it to burn. But I do want it to simmer away and for all those sort of flavors to make really good friends in that pan for about five minutes or so. So in the meantime, let's go step by step through prepping your ham. Now, what you're looking for at the supermarket or your butcher is a, an already cooked smoked ham on the bone. So that's step one is purchasing. <laughs> that's what you're looking for. Um, I like to have one with uh, the bone in, so you've got that kind of handle here. And for this one, you really do want a little bit of fat underneath that skin. So you don't want a really lean ham, you want one with skin and you can see a little bit of that fat here. Uh, and what we need to do is take the skin off and then we're gonna prep that fat so that it gets all glistening and lovely and you'll see what I mean. The magic happens soon. <laughs> but to take the skin off, what you wanna do is get your knife under here. So you wanna make a cut here and then just with your fingers kind of work in between the fat and the skin and just really gently just separating that skin so that you're leaving the fat behind attached to the ham. Now if you get any rips or any tears or you get a bit stuck just use your knife to kind of loosen that and then keep going until that skin kind of reaches a point where it's up high on that kind of bone handle if you like and then sort of just take that off and then you should keep the skin because once you've baked and glazed your ham and you want to store it in the fridge, the best way to keep it nice and moist and stop it from drying out is to actually put the skin back on it. So don't waste that, don't throw it away. And now we are left with our kind of nude, looks like a nude, a kind of nude naked ham. Anyway, uh, weird, but it looks like it needs some dressing, which it does. Uh, we need to put our beautiful glaze on there. But first of all, we want to score that ham fat so that we have a beautiful diamond pattern finish uh, when we go to serve. So I like to start in the middle to make sure I get like a kind of, you know, centered diamond pattern. Uh, so I make one cut through here and then I go to the side and just about like three centimeters apart, more like. Just keep going and then back over the top. And then we switch this around and we make the diamond pattern the other way. Now once you've done that, your ham is ready to go into your baking tin. Uh, now what I always do is line my baking tin or roasting tray with some foil, uh, and then I put a baking rack on top. And this ensures two things. One, that glaze that we're gonna put on there is sticky and sweet, and I don't wanna be scrubbing burnt sticky sweet stuff off the bottom of my baking tray. So it's purely like a practical kind of thing. So that goes on here. And now we want to brush with some of our lovely sticky sweet glaze. Now be generous here with that glaze. I want this whole ham shining and glistening like it's wearing high vis. And now I'm just going to do a little bit of decoration with some star anise. Okay, now I just want some water in the bottom of the pan. Don't let it touch the ham or anything. 
That's just to make sure that we don't get too much burning on the bottom. And now we're ready to pop this guy in the oven 30 minutes, then we're gonna come back and glaze again. All right, so this is smelling delish. We're starting to get some beautiful color on here. Let's do another round of glazing. And then we're back in the oven for another 30 minutes. All right, so this is looking really quite spectacular. Still not finished yet. I reckon one more lick of glaze and we're good to go. So I'm just gonna pile that on. Now just 10 minutes more and then we'll be good to go. Wow, look at that amazing stickiness, the color, the uh, everything. And it smells so awesome. All right, best thing I think to do with a lovely beauty like this is pop the whole leg onto a big tray all right, look at that juicy ham and that thick, sticky glaze. Amazing. Oh. We've got all the cheese, the butter, the spicy, the garlic, all the things. These are not your average roast potatoes, my friends. These are my spicy gochujang hassleback potatoes. Roast potatoes. All right, so it's pretty hard to improve on a really good classic roast potato, but like I think this might be it, like the best roast potato ever. Maybe not ever, but like pretty close. <laughs> All right, we're gonna go in with a Hasselback situation here, which means we're gonna get heaps of like some spicy or some cheesy goodness like right through the potato. So let's deal with the Hasselback first of all. I'm gonna use some red skin potatoes here. You could use any potato that's good for roasting. And the trick to doing the Hasselback is that you want like a little guide on either side of the potato. So I just use some chopsticks. You could use a wooden spoon as well down each side here. And then that gives you so sort of, you know, the first couple of slices, you don't wanna go all the way down. And then you can use those chopsticks as a guide for slicing all the way through so that you don't cut all the way to the bottom. Now I'm doing mine fairly fine here. You could do them a little bit thicker if you wanted to, but I'm living for these potatoes. I'm gonna give them a lot of love. So we're gonna go all out here. And there you go. So you kind of have this really beautiful concertina kind of thing happening here. And that's gonna get stuffed with a whole lot of goodness. So anyway, pop that into a roasting tin and just keep on going. Okay, so now we have our glorious little tray here of our beautifully Hasselbacked potatoes. I mean, look at that, it's already it's such a joy. It's weirdly satisfying. Um, <laughs> Anyway, let's get down to this spicy butter part. So I've got some softened butter here. And then I wanna spice things up here with some Korean gochujang chili paste. So the great thing about this is it's not just about the heat, like the paste itself is fermented and it has a really beautiful savory, almost kind of like a, almost like a smoky kind of flavor. I don't know, it's good, it's good stuff. So I wanna get lots of that in there. I want some parmesan cheese in here as well. And some garlic. Now to me, like butter, garlic, potatoes, they are like one happy little family. You can go as hard as you like on the garlic. I like it quite garlicky. You can also pull back if you like as well. And now a little bit of spring onion here as well. You wanna make sure everything is really finely chopped for this because we've only got those like small, tiny little crevices that we wanna get our mixture into. So make sure your garlic and your spring onion are lovely and fine. And then a little dash of salt here. And we are good to go, just give that a mix. 
Now, just as an aside here, this makes for some pretty awesome garlic bread spread. So next time you're doing your garlic bread, put some of this on there instead. It's really good. Now I want some cheese here as well, and I want a really stretchy, creamy kind of cheese. So I'm going with some mozzarella. You could go in with whatever cheese you love though. Okay, so that's everything like prepped and ready to go. Now we gotta kinda get our hands dirty. So, uh, grab yourself a potato and smear a generous amount of that spicy, buttery goodness all over the top. And then what you wanna do is get your knife and kind of just run it through as many of those little slices as you can just to get that butter like right inside all those little crevices. I mean, I'm not gonna lie, this is a labor of love, but you know, I do love roast potatoes. <laughs> and these are definitely, definitely worth it. And look, that butter's gonna melt and like melt down into each of these little sort of slices anyway, so you don't have to be too, you know, fine dining about it. And then just keep on going. Okay, check out our little buttery friends here looking very snug in their little tray here. Now, what we wanna do is we wanna do a first bake where we kind of try and get the potatoes really nice and soft and all that butter like seeping in everywhere. Um, and then we're gonna to get to the cheese a bit later. So I'm gonna put some baking paper on first and that just gives us a bit of a buffer around getting a really nice tight seal and also make sure that, you know, some of that butter doesn't stick to our foil. Now, foil on top. So at this point, my friends, your house should be smelling like really beautiful, delicious, spicy garlic butter. That's what it should be smelling like. <laughs> Let's get in here and have a look at what our potatoes are doing. Oh wow, look at that color. Oh, so cool. All right, so what you wanna do here is just let them cool down a little bit before you go in with the cheese, because otherwise you're gonna get little burnt little fingers, um, which I don't want for you. <laughs> Um, or if you have uh, asbestos hands like I do, you could just go straight in. Now you just wanna get that cheese and really just try and stuff that in there wherever you can. So these are all cheesed up, ready to go. Now we just wanna blast them in the oven until that cheese is melted and bubbling and everything looks just delicious. Wow, I mean, look at that color, look at that cheese. Oh, this is so ridiculously exciting. Now I just need a little bit of spring onion here. Okay, so let's get in here and see what this is all about, because I can't wait. Uh, I just wanna see what's happening with that cheese. That kind of cheese pour really is like, I dream of that <laughs> at night time. <laughs> I can't wait to get in here and try this. Let's see, shall we? What is so good about that? It's like, it's like spicy garlic bread met some roast potatoes and like a whole bunch of cheese got involved. And that is really good stuff, my friends. Mm, I love it, I love it, love it, love it. You could serve this with roast potatoes, you could serve this with steak, you could just eat it all on its own, just on its very own. Mm. And you would be very happy. Yum. How do you take a crispy golden spring roll and make it even more epic? Well, you stuff it full of sweet, sticky pulled pork, of course. These are my pulled pork spring rolls. Let's chit chat pork first of all. So we're gonna be using a pork belly for this one, but you could also use pork shoulder, basically any kind of pork cut that's gonna get nice and soft and tender and juicy. So this is my pork belly that I've got today. Look, not all pork belly pieces are created equal when you're out there shopping for them. You really wanna get a decent hunk of meat in there, a f uh, you know, at least two little layers of fat, but not too much. I mean, you know me guys, I love fat, but you know, 
uh, just a little bit here is good. Okay, so pork belly, what I wanna do here is take the skin off. This is not a crispy skin pork belly recipe. I have some of those on my channel if you want one of those, but that's not what we're doing today. We're gonna take the skin off. So what you need to do is get your knife in here underneath the skin, just on top of the fat. And then just keep cutting through in here for a few more centimeters along and then flip the pork over. And now you kind of use that little piece of skin that you've cut as a handle while you angle your knife kind of about 45 degrees down and then just sort of pull the skin and that pulling action or the wiggling action will do all the work for you. Just hold the knife steady and there you go. Skin comes off. Let's get going on this lovely slab of pork belly itself. Now, what we need here is a little spice rub. Now, very simple. I'm going here with some Chinese five spice. And if you're interested to know what's in Chinese five spice or you'd like to make your own, you can check out my video on how to do that on my channel. Now, I also need some salt. Just give that a mix. And then you wanna sprinkle this really generously all over your pork belly sort of give it a little massage in there. Now that pork belly just goes out onto a tray lined with some foil and I've got a baking rack in there as well. The whole idea with that actually is that, I might do a bit of explaining about that, the whole idea is that the foil's gonna stop you from getting a whole bunch of mess on the bottom of your baking tray, one, because who likes to do washing up? And the baking rack's gonna allow enough space so that the air in the oven can kind of go all the way around that pork belly without the bottom sort of searing on the bottom of the baking tray. So there you go, there's method to the madness always. Pork goes on. Now here's where we need to exercise a little bit of patience. Uh, your pork belly needs to go into the oven, really low temperature for about three hours or until everything is beautifully soft and tender. All right, so pork is smelling amazing. That five spice smell and then that like roasted porky smell. So good. All right, let's get to the pulled pork stage because like that's really fun too. Get this out onto a chopping board. Now I like to get in here with my knife first of all. Now just check that out. I mean, look at how soft that pork is. Oh, this is the kind of thing that oh, makes cooking so joyful. <laughs> look at that. Ah, oh, so soft and tender. Wow. Okay, and like, as if you couldn't resist to try it right now. <laughs> Holy smokes. I mean, even if you weren't gonna turn this into a spring roll, which, you know, there is a risk that once you start eating this, you won't get to the spring roll stage, but even just that on its own, amazing. Five spice, the salty, the everything is perfect. Okay, let's get this into a bowl before I eat it all. <laughs> now you wanna get in here with some forks and just shred everything up. All right, so that is looking like one very delightful bowl of pulled pork there. And now I'm gonna add in my hoisin sauce. So we want this to kind of be sort of juicy hoisin kind of mixture. I don't want too much sauce because then we're gonna make our spring rolls soggy, but I want enough sauce so that each little bite is like juicy and saucy and yummy. Anyway, let's get this in here. Now mix that hoisin sauce through really well, get everything beautifully coated. And that is our filling done. So let's get on to the spring roll making itself. Now what you're gonna need here are some spring roll wrappers or in some parts of the world you call them egg rolls, so egg roll wrappers. These guys are usually in the freezer section of the supermarket and this is what they look like. And what you wanna do is just peel off one of these. Now I like to keep my spring roll wrappers covered all the time, just like a damp tea towel because they can dry out really easily. Now spring roll wrapper goes down. I like to have like a corner facing me. And now just make a little pile of your pork here and kind of push it around so that you've got, so you're like starting with a little rectangular shape and then pull the bottom up. And what you wanna do is pull it over and then kind of pull it back a little to tighten up that little cylinder. Roll a couple of times and then fold the sides in. And the important part here is trying to be expelling as much air as possible because air inside a spring roll is what will make the spring roll explode when it hits the hot oil, uh, which would be a disaster for everyone. Now keep rolling and just gonna get a little bit of water just to seal that last little edge. 
Now one more little tip here, if you find that your spring roll wrapper is quite dry and dipping your finger in the water doesn't actually get a really good seal here, what you need to do is just mix together a little paste, just equal parts plain flour and water, and you can use that as your spring roll glue. But these ones are pretty good, they're sealing with water, so I'm gonna leave them. There we go, onto our tray and let's make spring rolls. So at this point, you can do one of two things. You can cover this up with some cling film, get it into the freezer and keep them there for whenever you have a spring roll emergency. You can just fry them straight from frozen. Or you can just get on and cook them like I'm gonna do right now. So you need some hot oil and to check if the temperature's hot enough, just pop a wooden spoon into there. And then once you can see all of those furious little bubbles, then you know that the oil is hot enough. So now gently slide your spring rolls into the hot oil and then just add a few at a time with a sort of pan about this size I'm going to add in about six but you don't want to overcrowd them because then your oil temperature will drop and that is when you get soggy spring rolls and no one wants that kind of tragedy. Now our filling is obviously already cooked so all we're waiting to do here is get that spring roll wrapper pastry nice and golden and crispy. So just a few minutes here. So these are looking really good. Look at that colour. Oh. And you just want to drain these on some paper towel. So these are like volcanic hot when they first come out of the fryer. So please don't bite into one straight away. Let them drain and cool down a little bit on that paper towel. And then you can pile them up to your heart's content. So I'm just going to get them out here. Now you can serve this with a dipping sauce or not. Uh, sometimes I like to go with a bit of chili sauce, sometimes some extra hoisin, but let's have a look at what's going on inside one of these guys. Now just check out that juicy pork in there. Yay, look at that. Oh, let me have a look. Mm. That flavor is so beautifully intense it's so porky and then you get that kind of like sweet hoisin five spice flavor mm. and that pork is so soft and juicy i mean wow pulled pork spring rolls who would have thought mm. well i thought that's why i made them <laughs> mm. heaven Flaky pastry, silky, soft, eggy center. Yes, it is possible to make dim sum style custard tarts at home. I am so obsessed with those custard tarts that you get at the dim sum restaurant almost as much as the dumplings, almost. <laughs> now I've got a few little tips and tricks and shortcuts for making these at home. So I've got these muffin trays here. They're about medium size, about a one third cup capacity. Uh, now they are non-stick, which is great, but I'm gonna add a little bit of butter as well, just to be sure. Okay, so now we're gonna do the pastry and the dim sum tarts that you get at the restaurant, Pastry is really soft, flaky, melt in your mouth, um, but we're gonna take a little shortcut and get almost the same kind of texture. So I'm gonna start off with some store-bought puff pastry, and I want some flour on my bench top here. Peel off any wrapper. And now just cut that sheet in half, and then pop the other side on top. So what we've done here is taken the layers of puff pastry and doubled them up and then roll this up. Okay, now cut this into four pieces. Now if you flip these up, you can see we've got these rounds with loads of little layers of pastry there. So take one of those, a little bit more flour on top, push down with your palm and then just roll it out to about three millimeters thick. Now by doing that you can see here that we've got almost like a roti style sort of circular pattern here and that's loads of different layers of puff pastry that's going to give us that lovely flaky texture. Okay now I'm pretty loose and fast with uh, the stuffing of these guys into the muffin tin. I just kind of get them in, push them right down and any kind of little folds, I just press into the side. I like them to look a little bit rustic. 
Okay, and just continue on. And you know what? The great thing about this is that you're turning a square sheet of pastry into rounds and there's absolutely no waste. I hate when you have to cut rounds out of square pastry and you've got all those little bits and pieces left over. Okay, so I know we're taking a shortcut here by using store-bought pastry, but this next step, trust me, you cannot take a shortcut on. So these need to go into the fridge for 30 minutes and that will mean they'll firm up and then they won't shrink so much in the oven. Don't skip this part. So now let's do the filling and we're going to start off with some eggs and I'm going to do a mixture of yolks and whole eggs that'll give us a richer custard filling. So just separate those eggs. And then three whole eggs. Okay, now some caster sugar. And just a little dash of vanilla extract. Okay, just whisk this together first. Now I don't want to incorporate too much air here. I just want to whisk just a couple of minutes so the sugar dissolves a little bit. Now I'm going to add in my milk and some cream. And then just mix this until it all comes together. Now the easiest way to get the filling into your tart case is to get this into a jug first of all. Less mess. And now we just patiently wait for those tart shells to firm up in the fridge. Okay, so these tart shells now are nice and firm and we're gonna go against a traditional baking wisdom here. And I'm not gonna blind bake these, I'm gonna pour my custard straight into them and get them into the oven. Now don't overfill because this eggy mixture is gonna puff up quite a bit. Now I'm gonna bake these in a hot oven for 10 minutes, then I'm gonna turn the heat down, bake them for another 20 minutes. All the times and temps are on my website, so check out the recipe there. Okay, and look at these beauties. Such a gorgeous color in that pastry. And they're all puffy at the moment, but they're gonna to start to deflate any second now. Okay, so now time to get them out of the tin. And if you have a look at the bottom here, you can see the round layers of flaky pastry we created by just doing that extra little bit of rolling at the beginning. Mm, so good. Okay, so if we cut one of these guys open, you can see we've got just set custard, a little wobbly through the middle, and then that flaky, flaky pastry. Mm, this is one little joyous pastry package. <sighs> and now I'm very happy. <laughs> the ultimate pavlova. Crisp on the outside, marshmallowy through the center. Yep, there are a lot of ways that this can go wrong, my friends. But listen up, this is my ultimate guide to this Australian classic. This is my rum and berry pavlova. Today we're making my rum and berry pavlova. Uh, I love this one. It is a tricky one, which is why there are a lot of tips and techniques that go into this one. Let's go through it together. Start off with the rum and berry compote. You just need some sugar, water, spiced rum, star anise, ginger, cinnamon sticks, pitted cherries, and blackberries. Now bring this mixture up to a gentle simmer and cook for 10 minutes. Okay, so this is looking pretty good now. Uh, you can see the fruit is still lovely and whole, but I'm gonna add in now to thicken everything up a little bit of arrowroot. So I just need to mix that with some water and it only needs to simmer for another two to three minutes or until it's kind of got like a honey-like consistency. So this is the situation you're looking for. Things are looking glossy and shiny and it will thicken up a little bit as it cools down. So just set that to the side. Let's get on to making the pavlova. 
I need to separate my eggs first. And here comes tip number one for your pavlova. Make sure your bowl is incredibly clean. Any kind of oily residue or maybe soap residue might affect how fluffy and stabilized your meringue is. So clean bowl. And what I need here is 200 grams of egg white. Now, a lot of recipes will just give you the number of eggs, but eggs can be all sorts of different sizes. So it's really great if you can measure out and get the exact 200 grams of egg whites that you need. I've got six egg whites now, let's just weigh them. 200 grams, perfect, okay. So this now can go into my stand mixer. The mixer just needs to go on high and whisk these egg whites until they're sort of soft peaks. So once you've reached this kind of consistency, we're fluffy, we've got soft peaks here, now we can start adding the sugar. Okay, so turn this back on. And you wanna add the sugar in spoon by spoon. And the idea here is that the whisking action kind of helps to dissolve the sugar and the egg white together to form a really smooth meringue. Okay, so this is looking pretty good. Now, the way you can tell whether your meringue has been whipped enough is that you just grab a little bit on your finger and rub it between your fingers. And if you can feel any grains of sugar, get it right back in there and keep whipping. Now, this feels pretty good. I can't feel any grains of sugar. It has been whipping for quite a while, like at least 10 minutes, 15 minutes. So now I can go ahead and add in my stabilizers. And here's the next tip. Using corn flour and vinegar and mixing that into your meringue will keep it a lot more stable and give you a much better chance of getting the perfect pavlova. So this is looking ready to go. Oh, it's so shiny and marshmallowy. That's exactly the way it should look. Now over here, I have a tray with some baking paper. I've actually outlined a 20 centimeter guide here to help me get that nice round shape and start dolloping your meringue into that circle. Now to shape your pavlova, just kind of like try to stick within that guide because I do find that pavlova does puff a little bit so it will end up being a little bit bigger so I like to go kind of taller and smaller in this first instance. So just spread it out, nice sort of little wavy bits and pieces. Don't be perfect about it, pavlova should have like nice swirls about it. Now the cooking. So this is another really big tip for me. It's got to be really low and slow because the pavlova should just set without coloring. So into the oven, 100 Celsius for an hour. Once the pavlova is cooked, leave it in your oven, turn it off, but leave the door ajar and let it sit for two hours. So here we have what I think is the perfect pavlova, beautiful, crispy meringue on the outside. And then hopefully when we get in here, we'll see the marshmallowy center, but we need to decorate first. So just dollops of cream on top. And then spoon over your cherry and blackberry compote. Look at that color, I love that. So here we are, moment of truth should hear a little bit of a crack. And as you lift up that piece, you should see a beautiful marshmallowy center. Oh, that looks so good. And there you go, friends. That is my rum and berry pavlova. I am very excited about getting in here. I think with the pavlova is like, it should just melt away like a cloud. Oh, so good, so light and the perfect texture. Yum. Yeah.